I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to start a flame in your heart. In my heart, I have but one desire. Canadian Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present to you War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, narrated by Sir Lyle Watson. The chapter's title is Friday Night. The most extraordinary thing to my mind of all the strange and wonderful things that happened upon that Friday was the dovetailing of the commonplace habits of our social order with the first beginnings of the series of events that was to topple that social order headlong. If on Friday night you had taken a pair of compasses and drawn a circle with a radius of five miles around the walking sand pits, I doubt if you would have had one human being outside it, unless it were some relation of stent or of the three or four cyclists or London people lying dead on the common, whose emotions or habits were at all affected by the newcomers. Many people had heard of the Silner, of course, and talked about it in their leisure, but it certainly did not make the sensation that an ultimatum to Germany would have done. In London that night, poor Henderson's telegram, describing the gradual unscrewing of the shot, was judged to be a canard, and his evening paper, after wiring for authentication from him and receiving no reply, the man was killed. He decided not to print a special edition. Even within the five-mile circle, the great majority of people were inert. I have already described the behavior of the men and women to whom I spoke. All over the district, people were dining and supping. Working men were gardening after the labors of the day. Children were being put to bed. Young people were wandering through the lanes, lovemaking, and students sat over their books. Maybe there was a murmur in the village streets a novel and a dominant topic in the public houses, and here and there a messenger, or even an eyewitness of the later occurrences, caused a whirl of excitement, a shouting and a running to and fro. But for the most part, the daily routine of working, eating, drinking, sleeping, went on as it had done for countless years, as though no planet Mars existed in the sky. Even at Walking Station and Horse Cell in Chopham, that was the case. In Walking Junction, until a late hour, trains were stopping and going on. Others were shunting on the sidings. Passengers were alighting and waiting. And everything was proceeding in the most ordinary way. A boy from the town, trenching on Smith's Monopoly, was selling papers with the afternoon's news. The ringing impact of trucks the sharp whistle of the engines from the junction, mingled with their shouts of men from Mars. Excited men came into the station about nine o'clock with incredible tidings and caused no more disturbance than drunkards might have done. People rattling London words peered into the darkness outside the carriage windows and saw only a rare, flickering, vanishing spark dance up from the direction of Horsell, a red cloud and a thin veil of smoke driving across the stars and though that nothing more serious than a heath fire was happening. It was only around the edge of the common that any disturbance was perceptible. There were half a dozen villas burning on the walking border. There were lights in all the houses on the common side of the three villages and the people there kept awake till dawn. We are going to need a quick, a quick break to listen to the Mills Brothers sing their famous and always entertaining song. Paper Doll. Enjoy. I'm gonna buy a paper doll that I can call my own. A doll that other fellows cannot steal. And then the flirty, flirty guys with their flirty, flirty 
We'll have to flirt with dollies that are real. When I come home at night, she will be waiting. She'll be the truest doll in all this world. I'd rather have a paper doll to call my own than have a fickle. Minded real life girl. I guess I had a million dollars or more. I guess I played the doll game over and over. I just quarrelled with Sue, and that's why I'm blue. She's gone away and left me just like all. Dolls do. I'll tell you, boys, it's tough to be alone, and it's tough to love a doll that's not your own. I'm through with all of them. I'll never fall again. Say, boy, what you gonna do? entertaining song, Paper Doll. And now, back to the chapter, Friday Night. A curious crowd lingered restlessly, people coming and going, but the crowd remaining, both on the Chatham Bridge and Horsell Bridges. One or two adventurous souls, it was afterwards found, went into the darkness and crawled quite near the marshes, but they never returned, for now and again a light ray like the beam of a warship's searchlight swept the common and the heat ray was ready to follow. Save for such that big area of common was silent and desolate and the charred bodies lay about on it all night under the stars and all the next day a noise of hammering from the pit was heard by many people. So you have the state of things on Friday night. In the center Sticking into the skin of our old planet Earth like a poison dart was this Silmi, but the poison was scarcely working yet. Around it was a patch of silent common smoldering in places, and with a few dark, dimly seen objects lying in contorted attitudes here and there. Here and there was a burning bush or tree. Beyond was a fringe of excitement, and further than that fringe the infl inflammation had not crept as yet. In the rest of the world, the stream of life still flowed, as it had flowed for immemorable years, the fever of the war that would presently clog vein and artery, dead nerve and destroy brain had still to develop. All night long the Martians were hammering and stirring, sleepless, infatigable, at work upon the machines they were making ready, and ever and again a puff of greenish-white smoke swirled into the starlit sky. About eleven, a company of soldiers came through Horsell and deployed along the edge of the common to form a cordon. Later, a second company marched through Chopin to deploy on the north side of the common. Several officers from the increment barracks had been on the common earlier in the day, and one, Major Eden, was reported to be missing. The colonel of the regiment came to the Chatham Bridge and was busy questioning the crowd at midnight. The military authorities were certainly alive to the seriousness of the business. About eleven, 
the next morning's papers were able to say, a squad squadron of Hussars, two Maxims, and about 400 men of the Cardigan Regiment started from Aldershot. A few seconds after midnight, the crowd in the Curtsy Road, walking, saw a star fall from heaven into the pine woods to the northwest. It had a greenish color and caused a silent brightness like summer lightning. This was the second Silmar.